This is John Black, Super Chemist. This is not an instructional video. It is just a vlog showing a video account of some chemistry experiments I have done or I'm learning about. I do not go over all safety concerns, so if you repeat anything in the video, you do it at your own risk. All right, I should have done this in the first video, part one, but I didn't. Um, but So I'm going to do it now. In the first video, the apparatus was just so big, you couldn't see it all in one shot but here you can this is actually what what the apparatus I used was it was distillation over here you can see I had the ethanol in here this was the tube furnace tube that I had the heat tape around uh, boil the ethanol would come off be condensed and go into this trap now the ethanol was uh, high boiling enough to where it would get caught here but the rest of it would come out here and I should have had a suck back trap here but I didn't. It went into this bubbler that was full of vodka that was chilled, and that's where most of the, or pretty much all of the product uh, got stuck in. Then whatever was left came out this hose and went into another trap and condenser. And if there was any acetaldehyde in there by now, it's cold. It can easily be condensed and drip down into this trap. Although we found out that it was pretty much useless. I got less than a milliliter of stuff in there. Anyways, we're still making hydrogen. It would come out here, go into the suck back, go into another bubbler, and then a hose that would go outside. I just wanted to let you know that, you know, in case you couldn't tell exactly, this is a nice, easy way to see it. Now let's get back to the video. All right, let's continue from part two. Remember I was saying I was going to have an apparatus like this where I boiled water and I got lengths of tube longer and longer until I could get the vapor coming out at 300 degrees Celsius. What I'm going to do is I'm going to buy some thermostats and some more heat tape and I'll put the first foot, you know, maybe put 200 degrees Celsius on my thermostat. Second one I'll put 300 degrees Celsius and see what the temperature is and then I'll lengthen the tube and, you know, do more experiments until I get the temperature of the vapor up to what I want it to be. And I want it to be at 300 C, okay? Now, the catalyst, I want it to be between 275 and 290 C. I'm going to set my thermostat at 275, okay? Now, remember when I said there's four problems you want to overcome to get a good yield, and you'll be guaranteed a good yield. This is the first problem. Instead of guessing, I did 10 experiments where I guessed, I'm going to actually know for a fact that I will be getting you know, the temperature that I want. After I do this with water, I'll connect this up with the trap so that it's not out to the atmosphere because I don't want the vapor to come out and blow up. But I'll use ethanol then and make sure that the ethanol can also get up to 300 degrees just like the water did, okay? Then I will have number one taken care of. I won't have to worry about it or, or be thinking, oh, do I have it up to temp? I don't know. I'll have thermostats. And I'll have experimental proof that it is the temperature it is, okay? Okay, now another thing to get the temp up, you know, the vapor up to the right temperature, I'm going to use a smaller diameter, inside diameter pipe or tube, right? I'm going to try to get it to 12 millimeters instead of what I was using, which was 23, okay? That way it has more of a chance of touching the pipe and getting up to the temp I want, all right? Um, and that way I'll know what size quartz tube to buy, okay? When I buy it, I'm going to fill it up with catalyst. Now remember, the first experiment, I used 400 milliliters of ethanol. I got 8 milliliters of product. The next time, I put, I filled up half of the, the part that was empty, that tube furnace, the first half of it was empty. I filled it up with wool, quartz wool. I, got, I only used 200 milliliters, and I got the same eight milliliters of product. So I doubled my yield, okay? But when I took the heat tape off, I noticed that the quartz wool had disintegrated. And then that's where I made my mistake. I just filled it up, the whole tube, with copper on uh, carbon catalyst. And I actually did it one time with copper oxide on carbon catalyst. But I kept getting crappy yields. I was making a lot of hydrogen, so I know it was... Uh, doing stuff, but my, 
product that came over, you know, it stopped being ethanol. Like my first two runs I did, I had a lot of ethanol that I distilled out, you know, that I could reuse. Whereas after, after I started filling it up all with copper, I wasn't getting any uh, ethanol over heart. Well, I was getting some, but not as much. I, but I was getting a lot of byproducts uh, like diethyl ether, ethyl acetate, acetic acid, etc., etc. So anyways, I'm going to just fill it up with 15 mil millimeters of length inside that tube of catalyst. That's it. That's all you need. It's a very fast reaction. You know what I mean? Um, now I want to read this, order, this paragraph. Unsupported copper catalysts provide superior acetaldehyde selectivity under identical reaction conditions when using a uh, catalyst support structure, okay? But it suffers from lower thermal stability, meaning more sintering, also suffers from low metallic surface area, resulting in less acetaldehyde produced per gram of copper. So, yeah, you're going to make less acetaldehyde, but what you do make is going to be acetaldehyde, meaning you're going to make less byproducts. And the reason for that, especially when using an aluminum oxide uh, support, is that aluminum oxide, just by itself with no copper, if you send some ethanol through at 240 to 250 C, you're going to make ether and water. If you send it through at 300 C or 350 C, you're going to make the alkene, uh, ethene, and a little bit of acetaldehyde. So by using these silica, I mean the alumina uh, support, it's not only acting as a support, but it's also acting as a catalyst, making byproducts that you do not want, okay? So here's a good way to get centering down, uh, stop poisoning your uh, catalyst, and it'll last a lot longer, is to add other metals to the copper. I've read set several articles where they're saying use about 97% by weight copper and 3% weight by chromium, okay? And that will help cut down on sintering. Your catalyst will last longer, okay? And it won't uh, make more byproducts like the aluminum oxide would do. I'm going to use that, but I'm also going to use some co cobalt too. As you can see, 96% copper, 3% chromium, and 1% uh, cobalt. Now, will the cobalt work? I don't know. Uh, but I do know that the chromium is a definite good thing to put in there. Just a couple percent by weight, okay? Now, the fourth thing that you can do to, the fourth thing you can do to, uh, you know, increase surface area of your catalyst. See, the thing about uh, surface area is you know, you think you have a particle of copper, and that whole thing of copper can be a catalyst. But there's only certain active spots on the copper, okay? And obviously, it's on the surface. The stuff inside ain't going to do nothing. The ethanol isn't going to touch it inside. It's just going to touch the surface. So the more surface area you have, the more active sites you have, right, to be a good catalyst, all right? Now, there's two types of catalysts that are commonly used. I'm sure there's more. But the two main ones are silic silicon dioxide and aluminum oxide, right? Like I said, the aluminum oxide isn't that, you know, it'll help your, it'll cut down on centering, cut down on carbonization, uh, cut down on a lot of stuff, uh, but it activates more byproducts by acting as a catalyst instead of a catalyst support. The silicon dioxide is the best, okay? Now the silicon dioxide, you want the amorphous kind, meaning silica gel. And I'm going to, I'm not going to describe how to make it. I did do three videos on this silica, how to make silica gel. And there are ways to uh, make the pores bigger or smaller, make the surface area more or less. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to show you a video. I think it's by uh, the Backyard Scientist. I will put a link to that video on how to make silicon dioxide, silica gel, in the description of the video below this video, so you can go look at it. It's a great video. He's a great guy on YouTube. 
uh, all, all good videos he has. Um, but I've watched it probably 50 times over the last five years, and basically he's just making sand, but it's a good video. Uh, how much surface area you'll have with that making it that way, I don't know. But I do know you will have more surface area than you will have just using regular uh, copper by itself or copper and chromium by itself. All right, and I'm going to go into how you get the catalyst on to the catalyst support, probably in part three, okay? Uh, aluminum oxide, alumina. I want you to keep in mind that if you just go get alumina, it's probably alpha alumina, which does not have a lot of surface area, does not have the crevices and caves that gamma alumina have. See, this gamma, you know, alpha, beta, theta, those are uh, meta phase structures they're just basically different forms of the same thing okay and the gamma is the one you want and i'll go into how to make that in part three too um, a few ways you can make it but you want the gamma alumina okay all right let's talk about some reactions and equations i'm going to talk about the formox pro process that's the industrial way they make formaldehyde by catalytic oxidation of methanol you can change the word formaldehyde with a set of aldehyde, change the word methanol with ethanol. It's the same experiment, okay? You can see by the equation one ethanol, a half of oxygen, makes a set of aldehyde and water. If you use iron oxide, you're going to do it about 300 to 400 C. With silver, about 650 C. With copper, about 700 to 750 C. You can see that's a lot higher than the way we were doing it. And you need oxygen, okay? Now, the way you would do that, you'd get a fish pump, and you'd get some plastic tubing from the fish store, and you'd get a check valve from the fish store, right? Put them all up in series, and then this last one here, you would connect the plastic tube coming out of the check valve onto a glass tube, right? And this little adapter here is actually for a thermometer. You get the tube, the glass tube, to be the same thickness of a thermometer, so it fits in there perfectly. Then you make it into an L shape, so you can shove it in there, and it'll point up into the furnace tube instead of down into the reaction pot, right? And I've done this. It works. I've never done the experiment, but I've set this all up to see if I could get the air to pump through and, it, you know, do it at a good rate. And it works perfectly. Um, this is the oxidation reaction. Now, what I did in the video is not an oxidation reaction. Okay, the reaction I was doing was a dehydrogenation. It's done at lower temperatures and no oxygen is needed. So I like that. Less apparatus and lower temps, okay? You can see, you get one alcohol, you don't need any oxygen, 250 to 290 C, you make a set of aldehyde, and instead of that nasty water you're making with an oxidation, you make H2, which just goes, bubbles out of the experiment, you know what I mean? Instead of staying there messing things up, all right? That's what I did. No matter what you do, though, you're going to have a combination of both. If you add ox oxygen and you have higher temperatures, mostly it's going to be oxidation, but you're going to have a little bit of dehydrogenation. And the same with the dehydrogenation. If I have no oxygen oxygen like the way I did it there's still going to be a little bit of oxidation reactions okay but once the air is pushed out by the ethanol vapors and there's no oxygen you're basically going to have dehydrogenation okay but I like the dehydrogenation and like I says I mean do you really want copper at 700 to 750 C that's ridiculous 300 C is a lot better okay no water uh, is made uh, no oxygen is needed. It's just a better deal all around, in my mind. The oxidation reaction is exothermic. The dehydration reaction is endothermic. All right, the only thing we have to go over in part four is how to make these uh, catalyst support structures like alum gamma, alumina, or amorphous silica, which is silica gel, and how to get the... I finally figured out how to get the metal on to the support. There's an actual technique so that it's all distributed evenly. Anyways, you all have a good day and always remember, science is great.